Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Well, I'm real happy to be with you and I'm happy to see folks here. We're going to look at um, something interesting before we start. I was going to read you something because I think I found something that's really nice. And I'm always wondering, excuse me, I, I'm always wondering how we can explain to you the teacher and the student. I'm always looking at that. <laughs> Because sometimes, you know, people come and um, they, they write you and they come to you and they expect you to fix them. Sort of like I have a little buzzer back here and I can go, eh, and everybody's fixed. It doesn't work that way, you know? And so this is, is uh, I usually go to 107 and I talk about uh, Ganaka Mogalana talking to the Buddha, and he's talking about uh, how he trains his accountants. And then he says to the Buddha, I understand that you are teaching something that <clears throat> has a gradual uh, set of knowledge, and then you have a, a gradual training, a gradual practice, and a gradual progress. And then he explains to the Buddha how he teaches the, the methodically, how methodically he teaches the um, accountants. I teach them ones and tens and hundreds and thousands and ten thousands and hundred thousand, and how he teaches them to do everything with them. Of course, in those days too, they had the, the um, abacus, yeah. And the abacus is marvelous because I used to go to the bank when I lived in Taiwan. I, I used to go to the bank to, to add up things on the deposit slip and then put it in the bank. And I was adding it up and she was adding it up and she was always doing it faster than me. <laughs> so when you watch somebody really work an abacus, I don't have one here. Usually I have one to show you. It's like with these little beads going like this and then the black one is for so many and then they're going like this and they can add subtract um, add subtract multiply and divide faster than somebody can do it on an adding machine that was what was so funny now back then the adding machines weren't on our phones but you were still punching it in and going like this and punching it in and going like that and they could just look at it and go really fast i wish that I could enlighten you that way. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but it doesn't happen that way. And this was an interesting way to look at a teacher. It's about, this was about a guru who was actually talking to a student. And he says that the teacher, um, the teacher demands one thing only from the student, clarity, and intensity of purpose, a sense of responsibility for oneself. This is the first part. He says the very reality of the world must be questioned. And this is true with what we're doing. Who is the teacher? After all, he is the, the one who knows the state in which there is neither the world nor the thought of the world. And the Buddha was the supreme teacher in this respect. To find the teacher means to reach the state in which imagination is no longer taken for reality without question. Please understand that the teacher stands for reality, for the truth. We would say the present time, the present time and the reality. And then please understand that the teacher stands for this, um, this uh, uh, truth and this reality that you discover. 
the teacher is a realist in the highest sense of the term. The teacher cannot and shall not come to terms with the mind and its delusions. The teacher comes to take you to the real. Don't expect the teacher to do anything else. All we can do is point. And I thought that was really good. I go in and out of this book every once in a while. It's really fun. And um, I go in there because there's so much of an alignment. This is called I Am That, the book. It's called I Am That. And it was by a very famous Maharaja was who, a guru that was here in Maharashtra. Unfortunately, I missed him. <laughs> he was, he died. I can't remember when he died. Um, it was not that far back, but I wasn't here yet. So I couldn't go and, and see, listen to him. But so many things um, that we're talking about are also in what many of the gurus were trying to teach the people. But this one was especially good because he really pushed people to understand he kept working all his life, very simply in a little wood shop, I believe. And um, he pushed people to understand the relationship between the teacher and the student. Now, see, in the case of the Buddha, we have the Chalki Sutta in number 95, which tells us, the Chanki Sutta tells us precisely 12 pieces of the relationship between the teacher and the student. So uh, the Buddha didn't skip anything. And I think the unfortunate thing is when we try to go to the Samyutta Nikaya first or the Anguttara Nikaya first without going to Majjhima Nikaya as the main structure for you for learning your practice, we will miss an awful lot of things. Because in the Samyutta Nikaya, the, the, it's set up you know, by a set of um, topics. It, it's different, okay? So when I look in the front of the, in the Samyutta Nikaya, what I'll see, is when it starts talking about the, the nitty gritty part of your your practice or what Buddhism is about, it'll say the book of the six sense doors. So the six sense basis is one whole book, which has many, many things, uh, many different things in it. And then the next part, that's part four, part, part five is the Mahavaga. And that one is about paths and factors of enlightenment and establishment of mindfulness and things like that. Okay, it has a book on causation specifically. Now we use that book in conjunction, the causation book in the Samyutta Nikaya, we use that in something like 86 suttas about specifically dependent origination. And uh, it clears up a lot of things. That's that book when it's set up like that. Then you have one called um, the book of the aggregates, that one was part three. So it's the five aggregates, body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness, which we talked to you about. We can go there to find things to back up what we're saying, but it's not structured with the whole teaching in it. This is what is different. And um, so I know they teach in the universities in a different order than I recommend. But if you really are working to see at the same time as you are working to study, I highly recommend uh, that you get down to the index. I'm trying to get ready to print, <laughs> you know, now, which is 76 of these 152 suttas that are in the Majjhima Nikaya that Bhante advised me are the ones he drew the most information from concerning the support for his meditation, okay? Now, you're going to have fun with this today. We are going to do the Gopaka Mokalana Sutta. You should have had that sent to you so that you can uh, kind of follow it, hopefully. And there's the answer to a lot of nagging questions that people ask all the time, you know, um, this is, I, I was hoping, I'm not sure he might not come to the Sunday one, but you, 
in uh, over in London is always asking me, where is it that it talks about good and bad meditation? That's in here, okay? Then um, no arahat will ever have all that the Buddha had. That's a question. If you become an arahat, are you a Buddha? No, 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 no. And why do we say it that way? Because the Buddha was in the forest and talked about the leaves in his hands. Then he was on the beach. He talked about the grains of sand under his fingernail. And he said, this is all you need in this lifetime. But I have all the grains on the beach of the whole, the whole beach, all the grains of sand. That's my knowledge. In the case of the forest, all the leaves on the floor were his knowledge and everything from 100,000 lifetimes. And he's saying, all you need to get free is the leaves I'm holding in my hand. And then we used to have a good laugh because what kind of tree was it? <laughs> what kind of leaf was it a willow tree? Then each leaf is like my finger. So he could, he was a big man. He could have held like hundreds of leaves in his hand. If it was a maple tree, it would have been a different story. If it was a Bodhi tree, depending on the age of the Bodhi tree, it, it, it goes on and on. You know, what kind of leaf was it when he said the leaves in my hand? What kind of forest was he standing in? Another one. Okay, so that, that's there. We are not uh, without refuge when the Buddha is gone. That question is answered in here. Then another one is there's no successor that was named after the Buddha went into Parinibbana. And yet, yet today, there are still monks who exist, who are actually, uh, you know, some of the Mahatera monks, professors in universities who will write books and tell you the Gotama family. This was a, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the dynasty of the Gotamas, and it's handed down and handed down in the Gotama house. No, 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 this has nothing to do with that, you know? Okay, but there was no successor and he tried to specifically tell us what to do if he was gone. He had the discussion in here with, uh, is mentioned again with Anandas. These are the things you can listen for. And <clears throat> the other thing is making the assumption uh, that the, um, okay, that if you're an um, Arahat, all the iddies open up for all the arahats. And iddies are the powers, like flying, walking through the wall, reading other people's minds. And then the one person can become the many and then go back to the one again like that. And, um, and he is, this isn't what's happening. All right. And then the the nice one in here is the 10 qualities. So let's get into it. It's not a real long one. It's really should be able to go right through. <clears throat> so this is the Gopaka Mogalana Sutta with Gopaka Mogalana. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the venerable Ananda was living in Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel's sanctuary, and one has to question why anybody would want to live in a squirrel sanctuary where there are hundreds and hundreds of squirrels around you all the time. <laughs> they never stop. But not long after the Blessed One had attained his final nirvana, this is where he resided. Now, on that occasion, King Ajatasattu Vedahiputta of Magadha, being suspicious of King Pajota was having Rajagaha fortified. He was building around the city of Rajagaha a new wall. And then when it was morning, the venerable Ananda dressed and taking his bowl and his outer robe, he went into Rajagaha for his alms. And then the venerable Ananda thought, it is still too early to wander for alms in Rajagaha. Suppose I went to the Brahmin Gopaka Mogalana at his workplace. So the Venerable Ananda went to the Brahmin Gopaka Mogalana at his workplace. And the Brahmin 
Gopaka Mogalana, he saw the Venerable Ananda coming in the distance and he said to him, let Master Ananda come. Please come, welcome Master Ananda. It is long since Master Ananda found an opportunity to come here. Let Master Ananda please be seated, the seat is ready. And the Venerable Ananda sat down on the seat made ready and the Brahmin Gopaka Mogalana, he took a low seat and sat down on one side and asked the Venerable Ananda a question. Master Ananda, is there any single bhikkhu who possesses in each and every way all the qualities that were possessed by Master Gotama, accomplished and fully enlightened? And Ananda answers, there is no single bhikkhu Brahman who possesses in each and every way all the qualities that were possessed by the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. For the Blessed One was the arouser of the unarisen path. He is the one that brought, it means he has brought the four noble truths to the surface again to be investigated by himself. He's the producer of the unproduced. They didn't have the path. The declarer of the undeclared path, he's teaching it and it gets better and better across the 45 years he teaches. And he was the knower of that path, the finder of the path, the one skilled in the path. But his disciples now abide following that path and become possessed of it afterwards. So this is kind of like, you know, the information has been found. It's just really like any other religion. It's been found and put together and we don't have to do all the search work and a lot of the stuff that he had to do over six years or so in order to figure out the answers. So this means, no, you don't have to get the metal stuff on the leather strap and beat yourself anymore. You don't have to lie on nails. You don't have to torture yourself. You don't have to stop breathing, stop eating, stop sleeping. You don't have to be doing these things to your body because he's clearly explaining it now. So he's trying to, one of the reasons he's explaining it this way, but this discussion between the Venerable Ananda and Brahman Gopaka Mogalana was interrupted for them, the Brahman Basakara, the chief minister of Magadha, while supervising the work at Rajagahi, he went to the Venerable Ananda at the workplace of the Brahmin Gopaka Mogalana. He exchanged greetings with the Venerable Ananda. <clears throat> when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and asked the Venerable Ananda a question. For what discussion are you sitting together here now, Master Ananda? And what was your discussion that was interrupted? <clears throat> and the Brahmin, uh, the Brahmin Gopakamogalana asked me, Master Ananda, is there any single bhikkhu who possesses in each and every way all of the qualities that were possessed by Master Gotama, accomplished and fully enlightened? And I replied to the Brahmin Gopaka Mogalana, there is no single bhikkhu Brahmin who possesses in each and every way all those qualities that were possessed by the Buddha, accomplished and fully enlightened. And for the blessed one was the arouser of the unarisen path, the producer of the unproduced path and the declarer of the undeclared path. He was the knower of the path and the finder of the path. And he was the one skilled in the path. And his disciples now abide following that path, uh, become possessed of it afterwards. And so this was our discussion that was interrupted when you arrived. <clears throat> Now, is there, Master Ananda, any single bhikkhu who was appointed by Master Gotama? Thus, he will be your refuge when I am gone, and whom you now have recourse to. So he's asking, was there a successor? Will there be a successor when Master Gotama is gone? There is no single bhikkhu Brahmin 
who was appointed by the Blessed One, who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. Thus, he will be your refuge when I am gone, and whom we now have recourse to. But is there a Master Ananda, any single bhikkhu who has been chosen by the Sangha and appointed by the number of elder bhikkhus thus, that he will be the refuge after the Blessed One is gone and whom you now must take recourse in? No, there is no single bhikkhu Brahman who has been chosen by the Sangha, appointed by a number of elder bhikkhus, thus he will be our refuge after the Blessed One is gone and whom now have recourse to. But if you have no refuge, Master Ananda, what is the cause of your, con your concord getting along so well, making everything work so well in the Sangha? How does it work? We are not without refuge, Brahman. We have a refuge. We have the Dhamma as our refuge. But when you were asked, is there a Master Ananda, any single bhikkhu who was appointed by Master Gautama, thus he will be your refuge when I am gone, and whom you now have recourse to? Who is the one you have recourse to? There is, you answered that there was no such bhikkhu whom we now have recourse to. So when you were asked, is there a nod to any single bhikkhu who has been chosen by the Sangha and appointed by the number of elder bhikkhus, you said, uh, thus he, he will be our refuge uh, after the Blessed One has gone and whom you now have recourse to. You answered then, you said there is no single bhikkhu. So whom we now have recourse to? When you were asked what, but if you have no refuge, Master Ananda, what is the cause of your concord? Why do you still get along with each other? <laughs> you, you answered, um, we are not without refuge, Brahman. We have refuge. We have the Dhamma as our refuge. Now, how should the meaning of these statements be regarded, Master Ananda? Please explain. Brahman, the blessed one who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened, has prescribed the course of training for the bhikkhus, and he has laid down the padimoka. Padimoka is the rules and system for the monks to live by. And on the Upasaka day, as many of us as live in dependence upon a single village district, we meet together in unison. And when we meet, we ask one who knows the Padimokha to recite it once a month. And if a monk remembers an offense or a transgression while the Padimokha is being recited, we make him act it in accordance with the Dhamma, in accordance with the instructions. It is not worthy, just the worthy ones that make us act. It is the Dhamma that makes us act to preserve it. This is how it's done. Now, I'll tell you, I've been in very few places where this is actually happening. But in Tripura, in India, it is preserved. And as you drive through that area, the whole entire part, that whole entire state, you will find the little fenced in areas with the, they have these, like their posts where the different people sit by the posts, okay? And this is where they recite the potty mocha every month. And it's still active. And everything is working just the way it did in the time of the Buddha. And the, uh, the Katina ceremony the, at the end of the range retreat is operating exactly the way it was in the time of the Buddha. Not only do they choose a monk and present him with uh, a robe as sort of like the winner, the best one who behaved during the whole range retreat and stayed in one place and all of that, and he gets the robe. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> there I have pictures uh, to show you uh, where... I, I should, should have put them together for you, where they're actually weaving the thread. First, they're beating the cotton off of the, off of the sticks, 
into one area. They're making what we call the boogers. They call them boogers as long as my finger and you roll them up and then you put them in a basket and give them to the person who's going to spin the thread on the spinning wheel. And then they're going to spin the wheel and they're going to make the thread and then they're going to have a competition. So there are seven or eight weaving houses in the place where I was. And so they're all competing to get the best thread and then they have to weave it in that day. And they have to do it all in a 20, I think it's a I think it's two days period. I think it's two days long <clears throat> to weave the thread, spin the thread and then weave the cloth and then dye the cloth and then make the rope and then set it up to present to the person at the end of the katina. It's a marvelous thing to witness. And it's happening the same exact way as described here with what we call the par par uh, parana, where the monks come together and as the, this is being read, uh, then they confess anything that they have uh, done wrong and are directed what to do from the, um, from the Vinaya itself in the potting book, okay? So is there a master in Nanda, any single bhikkhu whom you now honor, respect, revere and venerate and on whom you live in dependence, honoring and respecting him, there is a single bhikkhu Brahmin whom we now honor, respect, revere, and venerate, and on whom we live in dependence, honoring, and respecting him. But when you were asked, Master Ananda, if any single bhikkhu who was appointed by Master Gotama and so forth, you, you answered, there is no such single bhikkhu. And when you were asked, is there Master Ananda, any single bhikkhu who is been chosen by the Sangha, you answered, there is no such single bhikkhu. So when you are asked, is there a master Ananda, any single bhikkhu, whom you honor, respect, revere, and venerate, and on whom you live in dependence, honoring and respecting him, you answered, there is such a single bhikkhu whom we now honor, on whom we live in dependence, honoring and respecting him. Now, how should the meaning of these statements how should they be regarded, Master Ananda? There are, Brahman, 10 qualities. Now we get into the 10 qualities. 10 qualities inspiring confidence that have been declared by the Blessed One who knows and sees, accomplished and fully enlightened. And when these qualities are found in any one among us, we honor, respect, revere, and venerate them. And we live in a dependence on him, honoring and respecting him. What are the 10? Here, Brahman, this is the first one. Here, Brahman, a bhikkhu is virtuous. He dwells restrained by the restraint of the Padimokha. He is perfect in conduct and resort and seeing fear in the slightest faults. He trains himself by undertaking the training precepts. Number two, he has learned much, remembers much of what he has learned. He consolidates it when he has learned it. And such teachings as are good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, and which affirm the holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Such teachings as these he has learned much of. He remembers them, masters them verbally, investigates them with the mind, and penetrates them well by view. Number three. The teacher is content with robes, alms, food, a resting place, and medical requisites. This is your four requisites. This is what you're basically supposed to be packing and going on a trip. <laughs> and actually, I have to tell you kind of a funny story, but when I went home because Bonte was sick, okay, I literally did that. And the stewardess and I had a good talk about how wonderful it is not to have to go and get your baggage after you get off the plane. <laughs> It's very funny because I knew that I had clothes there and I knew that I had clothes here. So what's the point? And I just threw some things in a flight bag and I left. So number four, he obtains at will without trouble or difficulty 
the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and provide a pleasing, a pleasant abiding here and now. What does this mean? It means that he works with the jhanas as we work with the jhanas. And he understands saying here, it's saying four jhanas because the mental jhanas, the arupa jhanas are sub uh, sub pieces, sub divisions of the fourth jhana. Okay, so the eight idea of eight jhanas is a modern invention here today. We say eight. Okay, number five, he wields the various kinds of supernormal powers. Having been one, he becomes many. Having been many, he becomes one. He appears and he vanishes. He goes unhindered through a wall, through an enclosure through a mountain as though there was he was going through space. He dives in and out of the earth as though it were water. He, he walks on water without sinking as though it were the earth and seated cross-legged. He travels in space like a bird with his hand. He touches and strokes the moon and the sun so powerful and mighty he wields the bodily mastery even as far as the Brahma world. So what's he really talking about here? Well, there's different ideas about this, okay? Um, I'm still trying to walk through the wall. I think I've told you that every January 1st, okay? But it's the problem that I am trying to walk through the wall that is the issue here and trying to get let go of one reality to go through another reality. There's another idea that what he's, basically talking about is that the person masters OBEs and an OBE is an outer body experience with an energy body where we hear them saying, I have a body and I have a perfect body here or a perfect body above me. And these things are mentioned. It really brings to home the idea that they were very aware of the OBE and the OBE can only occur when you, the person naturally occur for a person if they um, put themselves in a state where there's no past thoughts, no future thoughts, where they're very much right here in this one place and they're empty. And before they went in, they did a determination that they want to leave and go play in the Pleiades, you know, in the stars and come back later, you know, and they lay it out that way. And there are some wonderful uh, books and things written about things that happened during World War II and things like that. Um, one, one was of a man who, um, the one famous one they considered was the longest, uh, uh, longest recorded OBE. And this was of a guy, he was a doctor actually, and he was in the army and he was wounded in World War II. And he wrote this later when he was older, he wrote the whole story, the whole thing out in a small book. And um, they had a huge uh, medvac tent, you know, tent system for the hospital, medical hospital on site, you know, on uh, active site when you're at war. And what happened was this has like all these different corridors in it like this, you know, that are coming out from the middle and they took him in the operating room where he was wounded. They had him on there and he died. And he died, uh, they did the normal thing. They did what they could. And then they put him in a body bag. They laid him on a stretcher. They took him down the hall and they parked it in where they had the body bags down the hall from there. Well, the interesting part is he talks about he could watch from above while they were working on him and he didn't realize when he actually pet when he died, he realized they were working on him really hard, but he was confused. He'd never done this before in his life. And what happened was basically when they, when they stopped with him, he thought, well, I'm out. So I want to see if I can move. And so he went down the halls, the different extension pieces of the tent to see where everything was happening everything that was happening he visited where the wounded were he went where triage was he went in the different departments and then he came back to get back in his body in the operating room but they moved it and then he got a little frightened because he didn't know how to get back into his body 
And this whole thing was something really heavy duty, like 42 minutes long. It was very, very long. And um, that he heard someone say where to put the body. And then he rushed down the hall and went in and went in and out of several bags until he found his body and went back in. Someone went in there and he started moving in the bag. And they figured out he was alive and he was in the body bag. That was the story. I remember reading that and thinking, this is crazy. This is right. And then I met people in Washington, D.C. who do this sort of thing regularly of leaving the body and going to visit their mother or see how their children are or somewhere else and come back. And I thought, you can train yourself to do this. But not everybody can easily be trained because of how our minds are working and our environment growing up and how we're upset or have a lot of things inside us we haven't let go of. So there's too much going on in our brain in the future and past things pushing in and fears and everything like that. But honestly, you, you should be able to take the time. I've never taken the time since I've been doing this, really. I don't think I did at all, really, over the years. Um, I think I looked into it once because I found the Monroe Institute in Virginia and I knew someone there and there was something else that was going on. I needed to have questions answered and went to them and found out that for $1,200 and two weeks of your time, they can probably get you to do this if you're really interested in doing it. And that was a long time ago. I don't know if they're still doing it. They can help people learn how to do it. But many people do this. My point is naturally, this is not something really freaky or metaphysical or like that, you know. So when you talk about that, let's look in here a minute what it said. He appears and he vanishes, which is very simple to do with an energy body. Unhindered, he goes to a wall. Once again, you have you have no relationship to the wall. So you just can pass through. That's an energy body. And through an enclosure, uh, to get out of an enclosure, just walk through a fence, go uh, through a mountain to the other side. And the one that's interesting is diving in the earth and coming out the other side. Part of this learning this is mastery of the elements, mastery of the four elements. It has to happen if they're totally mastered for the person to do this. So I think that somebody like him must have had it in another lifetime, you know? And that's one of the reasons it happened so naturally that he was uh, able to um, do what he did, you know? But he didn't have any desire afterwards to work with this. In those days, in the 1940s, this is pretty freaky. They probably would have locked you up. Seriously, it would have just locked you up if you were talking about this stuff. So we go on to section 19 here. Um, with the divine ear element, which is purified and surpasses the human, this is another kind of eddy, um, where you can hear something way far away, like a particular bird making a call way, way far away. He hears both kinds of sounds too, the divine and the human, meaning that you can hear a deva speaking or the environment where a deva is, but then you can hear what's in this environment too. And those that are far away as well as near. Then he, and the next one is he understands the minds of other beings and of other persons, having encompassed them with his own mind. He understands a mind affected by lust as affected by lust and a mind unaffected by lust as unaffected by lust. He understands a, um, a mind affected by hate or, affected or unaffected by hate. And he understands a mind affected by delusion or not affected by delusion. He understands a contracted mind, meaning really tightly shut, locked up so that it's not open at all, and, uh, and a, a distracted mind that's pulled away, pulled away uh, when it is distracted. And he understands an exalted mind, meaning that he is in an unexalted mind. And the exalted mind is working in the jhanas into the rupa jhanas. And he understands surpassed mind is surpassed mind and unsurpassed as surpassed, unsurpassed which is um, 
into the mental realms, okay, into the mental realms where you can go in, sit, and come out in a particular realm, okay? And then he, um, he understands a, a concentrated mind as a concentrated mind, an unconcentrated mind is unconcentrated. And that one, these are the ones we can relate to pretty much is distracted and uh, contracted and then distracted exalted and unex unexalted, surpassed and unsurpassed, and con concentrated or unconcentrated. Because your concentrated mind, you realize it's concentrated correctly because everything, you're able to watch everything easily. But unconcentrated, it means nothing's going to work with your meditation. And then he understands a liberated mind as a liberated mind or as an unliberated mind as unliberated. So this gives you a picture of a lot of these things you can you can understand the ones at the top you can understand as well we work with those lust or, or no lust hate or no hate um delusion you know lust and hate lust hatred and delusion these are the the three uh poisons that we work with letting go of okay now number eight he recollects his manifold past lives that is one birth, and this goes into an explanation what he did. This is what the Buddha did now on 51. I marked that. I'm not sure if I marked it. Let's see. 51 at 24. <clears throat> Here you go. <clears throat> when his concentrated mind is thus purified bright and unblemished it is rid of imperfections it is malleable wieldy steady and attained to imperturbability what's that all mean <laughs> um unblemished uh pure bright and unblemished is the result of your virtue being kept intact rid of imperfections not having anything bother you in the moment you know with the imperfections of leaving the the track you're on with watching in your object, malleable, wieldy, and steady, meaning I can, I'm can i in control of, I understand I'm in control of pointing an attention like this. So it's very malleable. I can do that easily, wieldy. That means I can point and point and steady. I can stay in one direction. And it is attained to imperturbability, highest level of equanimity, okay? Um, and that's where you're in quiet mind and you can experience in quiet mind uh, in the level of nothingness or um, uh, that's where you can realize you're experiencing a uh, imperturbability. And the real powerful imperturbability comes at the end when you go through once you come out, just nothing, nothing disturbs you. It's the first time you really face that. I think you guys have all heard me talk to you before about the difference between um, indifference and um, equanimity. And being indifferent to something is not equanimity, okay? Equanimity is when you hear a gun or uh, some, you're, 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 you hear a gun go off or you hear the backfiring of a truck really suddenly when you're driving, it kind of scares you. Normally your heart would start racing, your stomach would feel, would jump and like that. Nothing moves at all in equanimity. And it's kind of a shock because you're fully aware and um, you, whatever you've been through in the moment, you realize that it was something pretty horrendous that just happened in front of you or around you, but everybody else is screaming and really upset and you're there. <clears throat> Instead, you are sitting there or standing there watching it without getting upset immediately. So it's where your mind, your brain has taken hold of this uh, balance, this equanimity is a, is a good thing because then you can clearly decide what is essentially happening and decide what to do, whereas the other people are just lost. He, at this point, when you have this kind of um, control in your mind, <clears throat> at that point, he directs it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. And he recollects the manifold past lives. Now, he, this is the way the Buddha is able to do it by saying there is one birth, two births, three births, four births, five births, 10 births, 20 births, 30 births, 40 births, 50 births, 100 births, a thousand births, 100,000 births. 
many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. And then he had full recollection when he went through these things, when he looked back after having all those lifetimes, he was able to look back and say, this was my name, this was my clan, this was my appearance, <clears throat> such was my nutriment, <clears throat> excuse me, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such I lived this long, my life term, and passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere, and there too I was so named of such a clan and of such an appearance, and such was my nutriment, such was my uh, experience of pleasure and pain. He can remember very, very, very much in detail. All right. And such was my life term and passing away from there, I reappeared here. And this is how I got here. And the Buddha has places where he can, you can read this, the whole recollection of the genealogical line where he did the lifetimes that he went through. Thus, uh, with these aspects and particulars, he recollects his manifold past lives. So that one is the, um, is the, um, you know, we went through the 10, didn't we? Oh, I'm in 51. No wonder I can't find it. Okay. Um, so this is what he did. And let me get back to the page where I was. It's hard to crisscross here. Uh -huh. Okay. These were the aspects in particular. That's where I took you that far, right? Of the manifold past lives. Okay. Now that one is number eight, number eight. And we'll keep going for a minute, but may remind me that I come back to this so I can explain to you how you can learn to use this past life thing, but not in the same way the Buddha did. Would you remind me? Okay. So this was number eight, what he's telling you, he did this with his past lives. So he had full retention of everything that he had lived through in all 100,000 lifetimes. That's pretty valuable, you know, really. All right. And with the divine eye, this is number nine, which is purified and surpasses the human eye. He sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. And he understands how beings pass away on according to their actions. This is where you can go over to Majima Nikai number 135 to the Chula uh, Kama Vibhanga Sutta. And you can go in there and find uh, mention in 135 of how it is that people are looking, you know, how they are in life, inferior or superior, fair or ugly, fortunate, unfortunate. And he understands an explanation about karma and why, how people are in the situation they're in here. And it's a funny thing, you know, about things that block you in life. Because in 128, uh, Mijima Nakai number 128, at the end, in the last paragraph, if you remember, I told you there's a very important statement as soon as I realized that this was doubt or whatever it is, as soon as I realized that what was bothering me um, was an imperfection of mine, that I kept thinking on that, you see, it was an imperfection of mine, I abandoned it. And then he becomes in the position where he can practice and reach the opening of his mind. But as long as he keeps where he, he realizes that as long as he's thinking a lot about something that is bothering him in his personality, whether it's being shy or it could be anything, you know, and he's needling on that. He says, because I'm, he's, he's talking to them about abandonment is the primary thing you're supposed to do when anything is distracting you. And these thoughts of one thing, as you look at a, as a problem, most of the time they're not. Most of the time <clears throat> they are something that has come in a consciousness into this lifetime. And you can figure out with a little bit of work with past life work, you can figure out where they started. And then the moment you realize, oh, that's what this is. When you come back out 
it's not there anymore and it just stops it's a remarkable thing so he points to us and says once you see something is annoying frustrating nagging you bothering you distracting you causing a barrier causing a blockage abandon your thoughts about that because that attention was the food that gave it the power to keep going and that's what you want to let go of okay so then the tenth one was by realizing uh, for himself with direct knowledge he is here and now he enters and abides in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints now when we read this and it's just us <laughs> that some people try it and then they find out it's really helpful but when we say deliverance by mind it's deliverance by mind means we're delivered by our meditation and our knowledge of the dhamma that's the mind part of it and deliverance by wisdom that's the dhamma part of it also but deliverance by mind by learning how to let go of the past let go of the future stay in the present time just watch become a watcher and experiment what's your experiment what is the experiment sister kama well the experiment is can you experience an experience of no experience and when that happens realize that your mind your brain feels different and it's different for you when that happens and then when you come out of it you have a clarity of mind a um an innovation ability you didn't have before everything gets real the clarity of everything the clearness of everything comes and you can compute and notate and you know do a lot of things once you have this experience so this is opening of the mind and deliverance by wisdom is understanding specifically the seven links of dependent origination that we talk about that show you exactly how the suffering is happening so the person who has that and today um virtually because i think dependent origination is almost hidden from people and the monks have a lot not all the monks it's not everybody when i say the monks but many monks let's put it this way many many monks will tell you you're too stupid to understand this only we can understand this and that annoys me and i can't say anything when they say that you know i can't say anything back but it's very annoying because i can teach a taxi driver in half an hour how to change his life when i'm taking a ride from a temple to a downtown location in malaysia in kuala lumpur somebody who had a sixth grade education and i can if they're speaking english and they want to know i can show them how to lighten up and let go of the past that's just destroying you and this this worry about the future it's just just causing you problems and you can't sleep and you can't eat and or something when something happened in the morning um you know um i think i may have told you the story i don't know if i told you the story about the taxi driver or not from downtown colombo going back to the um the temple that I lived at about an hour away. And I got in the taxi in downtown after I bought some books at the religious bookstore. And, um, you know, when I got in that taxi, the thing was, I knew I had an hour and the internet's very good in those taxis. So I thought I'm gonna catch up on all my email in the back seat. Then I looked in the front and he had a little Buddha there. But the thing was, when I got in the taxi, it was very polite, very calm. And I sat down in the back seat. Then he was on the phone in a heartbeat while he was driving. And he's telling his wife, and I knew it was his wife because he's just going off in Sinhalese and really upset. And then he had the phone and I said, I looked at him in the mirror, I said, Oh, well, I don't need to do these, these air, air mail, these emails right now. I'll just put them away. And I said, you know, you seem to be really upset. And he said, oh, I am upset. He said really good English, you know. And so, well, what happened? 
He said, a man got in my taxi today and he told me where to go. He told me where he wanted to be, but he told me how to drive. He told me how to turn, told me when to stop. He bossed me around and he didn't understand. This is my taxi, my world. This is the way I do things. And nobody gets to tell me how to do my taxi. And he did that to me. And I said, wow, <laughs> what time did he do it to you? <laughs> and this was like, this was like about five o'clock going on six o'clock at night. And he said, well, it was early. It was on the way to, it was about nine o'clock this morning. And you're still worried about that? Man? Well, that man, he got in my taxi and he told me what to do, when to put the foot on the brake, when to put the foot on the, on the pedal, when, when to go fast, go slow, where to turn. He, he wouldn't let me take him to where I was supposed to take him to. And it's my taxi, my world. Nobody should come in there. He's, he was really upset. And I thought, well, wow. He's not here now, is he? <laughs> he said, I was looking in the front seat. He said, no, of course not. I said, well, where is he? He got out of the cab. <laughs> I said, well, I bet you were happy when he did that. But you seem awfully upset about this. And this is all past and everything. Yeah, but look at what he did. I said, don't tell me again. <laughs> don't tell me again. But do you understand that he did that this morning? And I'm in your taxi now in the back seat and you're driving. And the thing is, um, you don't have to be upset anymore because he's gone. Well, 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 I said, yes, but he's gone. And now you've managed to call your wife and tell her the whole story. Oh, it's about the fourth time I called her, he said. <laughs> Every time somebody gets in the cab, it re-stimulates my story. I want to tell it again. And he tells her again and again. I said, do you realize how exhausted your wife is going to be when you get home tonight. She's probably worried about you. When you get home, you're probably going to sit there and tell her this story again. And the man got out of the taxi. He's not there anymore. Yes, but he did that to my world. I said, no, no, he didn't do anything. You could have just let it be because what is it that you know will always happen when somebody gets in a taxi? What do you mean? When I get in, I always get out. <laughs> I always leave the taxi. So even if something's happening to you is the point. Anicca is your friend in this case because Anicca is change. Everything is changing. The person is going to get out. So leave it. You know, it's a customer. He's paying you money. So just stay with it and let it go. Well, I don't know. I said, well, you think about this. Think about it. Because this, you need to just let things go. Well, I could try to do that. He said, I could try. Well, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. And so he, he uh, by the time I got to the temple, um, he began to understand that he could just watch this person and then he would the incident would always end this is what he learned he learned about anicca i didn't even know he was learning that's the part he was going to remember the most and he dropped me off and he didn't pay, charge me anything <laughs> he didn't charge me anything he had a free lesson on life and he said i just want to thank you he was all calmed down when we got to the temple six months later six months later I went down to town to the bookstore again. I got some books and called a cab and a cab came at the bottom of the steps. There's a big thing of steps you have to go down. And down at the bottom, a man got out of his cab and he opened the door for me and I got, I got into the cab. Well, I didn't, I didn't remember him really. And when I got in the cab, uh, he, he said, uh, he said, do you remember me? And I said, about what? He said, you're the one that taught me about a Nietzsche, he said. And he put a sign, a Nietzsche, on the bottom of his little Buddha on the front. It says a Nietzsche under, underneath, just to remind him, no matter what happens in life, this is one of the first stories that you can play with in, in this teaching, in life. No matter what's happening, even if you fall off your bike, you know, it's, happening but it's all going to be 
over and it's going to be in the past. So everything is moving. It's like you're in a boat floating down the river towards the ocean. This is what it's really like. Okay. And so what happened was he said to me, I said, oh, I, I remember I taught you about a Nietzsche in the cab. And he said, yes, and my wife loves you. I said, your wife? What does your wife have to do with this? And he said, my wife's mother never wanted us to get married, you see. And now we have children and she always wants to go over there and visit her mother. And she doesn't like me. And we have a rough time every time we go over there because she wants to stay longer and I don't want to stay. But now everything's fine. I said, why is it fine? I go over and I say hello to her and I'm nice and I get some tea and I go out on the porch with the dog and I wait and it's fine. It could be a half hour, it could be an hour. Doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? He said, because of a Nietzsche. <laughs> I know in my head now, I am not stuck anymore, anywhere, anytime. Is he understands this. And this is just this taxi driver. He doesn't have a big education, you know, and what did he learn? He learned about the contact with the hearing the man say what he said to him. He learned about feeling, he learned about uh, craving and how upset he got and he didn't like the man being in his cab, but he also learned about a Nietzsche. And just a Nietzsche, somebody who's not Buddhist, you don't even have to tell him it is a Nietzsche. Just show him, let go of the past, let go of the future, sit here on this bench for five minutes, empty your head, and you're actually practicing like a Buddhist. <laughs> Don't tell anybody, you, you know, but you don't have to tell the person that's what you're doing. And this is a remarkable thing. Nobody's thought of teaching this to kids in school. And it's remarkable at this time when you think about all the things that are going on and that might go on and that could have gone on and that may have been going on. You know, you know, everybody's thinking about everything all the time. And you can calm down. And then you can start seeing how light life feels because you, won't, you don't have a backpack on you anymore from the past. You don't have a front pack on you worrying about the future. You just have you here in a bubble in this present time, one time, one thing at a time. That's, that's the lesson. And he learned it. Anyway, going on. So he figures this out. Then he says, these Brahmin are the 10 qualities inspiring the confidence that has been declared by the blessed one who knows and sees is accomplished and fully enlightened. And when these qualities are found in anyone among us, we honor them, respect them, revere and venerate the teacher. And we live in dependence on him, honoring and respecting him. Wherever the arahats went, whichever one went anywhere, it became this way. Whenever a teacher sets themselves up, that's what it's about to see if they have most of these things, some of them, not all of them, because all of them don't have all of them. <laughs> that's the thing. When this was said, the Brahmin, the Sakara, the minister of Magadha, he said the, to General Upananda, what do you think, General, when these worthy ones honor one who should be honored, respect one who should be respected, and revere one who should be revered, and venerate one who should be venerated? Surely they honor one who should be honored in that way, and they venerate them when they should be venerated. For if these worthy ones did not honor, respect, revere, and venerate such a person, then whom could they honor? Who would they respect and revere, revere and, and venerate? And on whom could they live in dependence, honoring and respecting? And then the Brahmin Vasakara, the minister of Magadha, he said to the venerable Ananda, where is Master Ananda living now? Now I am living in the bamboo grove, Brahmin. I hope, Master Ananda, the bamboo grove is pleasant for you, quiet and undisturbed by voices, with an atmosphere of seclusion and remote from people, favorable in conditions for retreat. Indeed, Brahmin, 
that the, the bamboo grove is that way and favorable as for a retreat. And it is because of such guardian protectors as yourself that this is so. Indeed, Master Mananda, that the bamboo grove is pleasant and it is favorable for retreat in such a way is because of the worthy ones who are meditators and cultivate their meditation and the worthy ones uh, who are meditators and, and cultivate uh, their meditation consistently. On one occasion, Master Ananda, Master Godama was living at Vesali in the hall of the peaked roof in the great wood. And then I went there and approached Master Godama and in many ways he gave a talk about meditation. Now, Master Godama was a meditator and cultivated meditation and he praised every type of meditation. And then now we have the statement in 26, section 26, the blessed one Brahman did not praise every type of meditation, nor did he condemn every type of meditation. What kind of meditation did the blessed one not praise? Here, Brahman, someone who abides with his mind, obsessed by sensual lust, a prey to sensual lust, and he does not understand as it actually is the escape from the arisen sensual lust. And while he harbors sensual lust within himself, he meditates, premeditates, out meditates, and mismeditates, and he abides with his mind obsessed on ill will. A prayer, a prey to ill will. And with his mind obsessed by sloth and torpor, and he becomes prey uh, to, to uh, sloth and torpor. And with his mind obsessed with restlessness and remorse, he is a prey to restlessness and remorse. And with his mind obsessed by doubt, a prey to doubt. And he does not understand as it actually is the escape from arisen doubt. And while he harbors doubt within, he meditates, then he premeditates, he out meditates and mismeditates. And the blessed one did not praise that kind of meditation. And then of course, when he says the negative here, he's going to say the positive next in 27. And what kind of meditation did the blessed one praise? Here, Brahman, quite secluded from sensual pleasure, secluded from unwholesome states, a, ma a monk will enter upon and abide in the first jhana. With the stilling of applied and sustained thoughts, he will enter upon and abide in the second jhana. And with the fading away as well of joy, he enters upon and abides in the third jhana. And with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana. And the blessed one praised this kind of meditation. So it's basically praising what we're practicing here, where you're going through the jhanas and experiencing them as you're passing through, you are experiencing what's given up in each one as you go into the next one. And it seems, Master Ananda, that Master Gotama censured that kind of uh, meditation that should be censured, and he praised the kind of meditation that should be praised. Now, Master Ananda, we depart now. We are busy and we have much to do. You may go, Brahman, at your own convenience, and then the, the Brahman Vasakara, the minister of Magadha, having delighted and rejoiced in the venerable Ananda's words, he rose up from his seat and he departed. And then soon after he left, the Brahman Gopaka, Mogalana said to the venerable Ananda, Master Ananda has not yet answered what we asked him. Did we not tell him, Brahma, Brahman, that there is no single bhikkhu, Brahman, who possess, possesses in each and every way all those qualities that were possessed by the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened? The blessed one was the arouser of the unarisen path, the producer of the unproduced path, 
He was the declarer of the undeclared path, and he was the knower of the path, the finder of the path, the one skilled in the path. But his disciples now abide following that path and become possessed of it afterwards. So it's basically this last piece is a statement that he came, he figured out everything. He uncovered the path. He became skilled in it himself. And then let's see if we do it right. He, the arouser of the unarisen path. So he got aroused to find the answer to the Four Noble Truths, and he put it together, the producer of the unproduced path. He went through and worked and worked until he got through and, and figured out how to go through to the point where he could go down the path and use it to go down the, through the jhana levels. And the declarer of the undeclared path, he started teaching it because it worked. Everything about this teaching is based on operational points. If it works, do it. If it's not working, tell me it's not working somewhere. Let's look closely at it from having someone else look at it is important. Because when we think we're saying what the other person said to do, a lot of times we're not. And when you come to interviews, they'll I'll say, and when you were sitting with the um, the object of meditation and you let it go, tell me exactly how you did that. When you tell me, I can hear what you didn't do very quickly. And then I'll say, now tell me if you've done it a few times, tell me what you didn't do. And if you leave the steps out, they don't work. This is a cake mix, folks. You can't just skip the eggs. You can't leave the yeast out of the bread. You know, you can't. One ingredient, sister, came up. Only one. Okay, take the yeast out of the bread and you get cardboard to eat, right? Okay, take the eggs out of the, out of the, uh, or take, leave the baking powder out of the biscuits. And they don't rise. They're little flat things like this, like hard as rock. You see? So the end result, you got to do the steps of the right effort completely with the smile and the relaxed step in there. That's where we were finding these pieces that he found them and said, well, I'll try this because it mentions it here. This seems like right efforts helping, but over here, it says the smiling thing over here. It says the relaxed step. Maybe if I test this was Bonte in the cave in Thailand, this is what he was doing. And he figured it out how it works very smoothly. So then what happens here is he says, uh, he's the producer of the unproduced path. He started teaching it. Nobody else was teaching it that way. The declarer of the undeclared path, he's declaring it now because everybody's making it work. And when you see that start happening, yeah, it's time to start letting more people know about it. And then they'll come to find out and try it. He was the knower of the path, the finder of the path, and this one skilled in the path. But his disciples now abide following the path, and they become possessed of it afterwards. Because it's already, the work's already been done. So when you stumble across, um, this is the thing. When you stumble across a place where there's all these monks torturing themselves, you know, they're fasting until they're skinny as the Buddha got with just their ribs showing. Why? <laughs> it's all right there that he went through it. And then he even gave you a sutta number 36 that explained what you're not supposed to spend time doing because he tells you why. Because nothing happened because I didn't get anything any full understanding by doing that. So don't bother doing that, please. And he lists them in 36, a big bunch of them about not breathing anymore, not eating anymore, not sleeping anymore. And he found out in the end, that's not gonna help matters. You need to be healthy. You need to have exercise. You need to be eating right. You need to not stop eating. You need to eat lightly, not overeat, but just eat, if you're eating once a day, when you're doing your retreat, when you're eating once a day, one person said, I can't do that, I'll die. No, you won't die, I promise you won't die. Come to me if you feel like you're gonna die. One person a long time ago, 
was so upset and we know what this was we do we tried very hard to make her to ask her to stay at the retreat not leave she was so ashamed because she stole an egg an extra egg they were allowed to have one egg in the morning but she took two and put one in her pocket and the afternoon when she came to the interview she confessed she did it because she was terribly afraid she would starve she wouldn't have enough food and she'd get sick but she didn't come and tell us she told and then we said well that's okay then take your precept again and stay no no i can't and i said to bhakti at the time I, what is this how did this happen and he said in another lifetime they were she was in a lifetime in another time where this was where food was extremely important because everything had been stolen and they were starving all the time they were starving and having to get food anywhere kind of like where i live right now you know and that's the first concern can we make enough money to get enough food to get to one day to the next day to the next day you see so this is where this came from and this was imprinted and she didn't even know why is that imprinted i'm living in america i have a car i have an apartment i've got a job why is this hitting me striking me so hard that she wouldn't stay long enough to find out and what this was a residual piece like when i tell you i got afraid of heights i was afraid of heights at 51 years old why did that happen you know why all my life, I was climbing trees 40 feet up and putting tree stands up there for uh, the guys in the family to do deer hunting and stuff. Why would I be afraid of heights all of a sudden? And then bang, it's there. Turns out there were past lives where there was a woman and each time the woman showed up, there were four, I went through four or five different ones. Those people were 50, 51 years old and they died by falling off a roof, falling off a wall, falling off the mast of a ship down to the deck and dying, falling off a cliff and falling into a big crevice that was in a pasture, in a, in a pasture. And when I asked someone, well, how old were they? It was always 50, 51, 50, 51. It became a clue. And the moment I realized this is just all an imperfection of my mind, this is nothing to do with this lifetime. The sphere of, is nothing to do with, with this lifetime at all. And within 24 hours, all the fear of heights was gone. Absolutely gone. At which point, Bonte gave me back the spoon again, the big spoon, and said, now go up on the roof and clean out the rain gutters. <laughs> go clean out the dirt in the rain gutters. And so I went back on the roof and cleaned out the rain gutters, but it all started on the roof about four months before, three or four months it took to figure all this out, three or four months. So how do you do this when you're, when you're having a fear of something or there's something, you know, you know that in your childhood, you had love and comfort and food and shelter and everybody was there weren't a lot of bad things happening probably but for some reason you came out older extremely shy why and why why did this come out when you were older when it was time to date or time to you know work with people why did you come out so shy all of a sudden that happened this is very interesting because maybe if you roll time backwards, you know, and you sit very quietly and just sort of roll time backwards a little bit, you, how do you do that? <laughs> Sounds really funny. You start by saying, what happened this morning? What did I eat? And you go, you go, okay, what did I eat last night for dinner? What, how did I sleep? What did I eat last night for dinner? You keep doing this back, backwards as far as you can. And you're just very, very quiet. You need to be in the fourth jhana. You need to have some equanimity to do this. And you need to say, okay, you can call me up if you want. But you just call me up and say, what was that? <laughs> you know, because I found situations. I did this for two different things. One for, for heights and one for hitting my head all the time in the same place for years and years, hitting it right here in the same place. And I found out the reason why with the head, 
I ended up in a cave with a body in front of me that was gutted full of worms and snakes and it stank and I could smell everything. And when I opened my eyes, I was not in the room I was sitting in. I was inside the cave and there was a person across from the other side of the body sitting there holding a child and crying. And it freaked me out. Now, when I did that, I was where Bonte was, and he was outside sitting down in the gardens of this place where we were staying. And I went down there with tears in my eyes, and I said, okay, okay, what is this? And he said, it's not real. You have to understand what you find is not real. It has nothing to do with this life at all. Nothing to do with it. It's just gonna just going to drift and a movie and I had to do them one at a time. Some people can go okay and then okay and then okay in one or two sittings. I can't, I couldn't do that. I haven't done it again in years. But sometimes things happen to us when we're older in our lifetime. I'd say above 25, um, above 20, uh, older than 25 usually, maybe even 30. And nothing has happened in your life like this, whatever it is before. And all of a sudden this comes up. Now I helped one woman who used to go camping in a river in Missouri and she was with her family and the river's very shallow. It's only like, it's only like this deep, four or five inches. A lot of the women used to take little beach chairs and put them out there and sit in there to, in the river to be cool. Let the kids play around them, you know, with the colored stones in the bottom of the river and the little fish and frogs and stuff, you know, and she could not go near the water, but she didn't know why. And I said, you know, I was talking to her and I, I asked Bonte about it. I taught her to do some meditation. Then I taught her, worked with her how to do this and only had her do it one time. And then I would check with her and one time check with her. She didn't come up top to the mountain. She made it work. She found out every time she did this, she realized she had died drowning before and it wasn't her. She, she said, it's me, but it's not me. Somebody else, they're dying from drowning. They're dying from falling and drowning in the water that's not real deep, or they're in a flood and they die, or they're, they're dying in swimming and they're dying, but they're dying from drowning every time. And she was so scared of the water. But as soon as she realized that those things that she saw happening were nothing to do with this lifetime, she felt like this doesn't make sense. Why am I afraid of it now? This doesn't have anything to do with me. It's not me. You see? And your brain goes, okay, fine, we can let go of that. And everything levels out. This is what happened. And I will tell you something too. You better play this at about 75, not 100% normal speed. <laughs> I'm talking too fast to you. But, but um, uh, there are people that are psychiatrists who started to investigate some of this. And as a... Uh, a system of helping people who had fears and, and that were happening. And they started using this idea of going backwards, okay, and, and doing some of that and looking at past lives. Some of them used hypnosis to do it that way. You don't have to use hypnosis. Something about hypnosis that always bothers me is, well, what questions are you going to ask me when I get hypnotized? <laughs> Do I get to hear about that first? <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell you. I don't really like that <laughs> idea. But this way, I'm just, I'm just watching the show, watching inside, and I'm letting go of everything around me. And no thoughts of the past, yesterday, this morning, nothing, nothing here, and this present time is going to be just watching the screen in front of me, this screen, and just seeing what comes up if I keep thinking backwards and then it'll start to just roll and it'll go like that. It'll hook into something is what it does. So it can jump. These were, old. I was not interested. Someone said, well, don't you know who you were, what the name of the place was, how old, you know, I said, I wasn't interested in that. Because uh, we had talked about it before, and um, I just was fascinated because I had never been never been upset about heights before. Ladders going up on the roof of the house, nothing like that, or climbing trees. So 
how did it happen? So I didn't find it necessary to know that the name of the people, the name of the place, the name of, you know, the clothes, I, I could see what the other people were wearing, but I wasn't even looking at what I was wearing when I was there. I wasn't even doing that. Um, one student ended up on a boat. He was Nordic. He was uh, from a, a Scandinavian country and he ended up on a boat standing beside a person and he looked at him and it was him, but it wasn't him. <laughs> he was there and is looking at him like you have a picture and you look like your grandfather, great grandfather, great grandfather, something like that. He said, and, and this was obviously the captain, they were on a ship and he could feel the ship going like this. He could smell the salt water and you know, in the sea, he could, he said it was so real, he could feel the wind on his face. And, and he just was so stunned, he came running down the mountain to tell Bonte, I was on a ship, I was on a ship, <laughs> it was like that. And, and, he, and then I don't know how far he went with that. I wasn't doing, I wasn't monitoring interviews back then, but I know that happened. And he knew that that was part of when his past. And um, I just thought it was fun because he could feel everything the way when I was in the cave, I could smell everything and I could feel the dankness of the cave and the very little air coming in where the entrance was and stuff. I, you know, really thought this is real the same way that he did, but I wasn't going to jump up and I just walked down to him and said, is it real? <laughs> you know what it's, it? and he told me, don't worry about it. It's not there. It's here now. Okay. Throwing it open to questions. We went all over the place with this. Did you learn something? <laughs> you learn something hmm? yes there are 10 qualities inspiring confidence great and out of which my <laughs> super normal powers are not included oh the super um the super normal powers went outside of that right i think so yeah well, I'm, I'm not sure wait a minute they went outside of it <clears throat> Go back. Ten. How to identify these ten qualities in a person? Take your time, spend time with them. Go back to the Chunky Sutta, it will tell you how. Chalky Sutta is going to tell you what you need to do to understand who the teacher is. See, the one, the one problem in modern times, I was told by a very old patriarch that he asked me when I first started doing this in the year 2000, I went to the celebration and um, they took me to the patriarch. I didn't even know why. And they said it got kind of got around that I really was going to I was going to attend Bonte and I wanted to study with him. And there were a lot of, they also knew I was going to go back to school, but I couldn't because the doctors didn't want to let me because there was a whole bunch of complications about this. So, but if I was studying with somebody where I could ask questions leisurely and there was no tension with tests and examinations and everything. And uh, that's when I decided I was going to study this way instead of going back to university. That's what happened. So when I was over there, word had gotten around about me. I was a little different. <laughs> and um, they took me to see the patriarch who was about 90 years old. And he stared at me and he said, so are you really going to do this? You think you're really going to do this? He said. And I said, I want to find out the answers. I need, I, there are a set of answers I need. And I need to find out really what's been happening and how. And he said, if you're going to do this, you have to be aware of one thing. The Westerner has a disease. They cannot sit still in one place. They cannot, they do not have the discipline to stay with a teacher for very long before they decide to run away and get another one. In fact, he said, they even build resumes to show you how many teachers they've been exposed to in the last three years, as if it's something they should brag about. So they never get far enough. And he, he had witnessed many people who wanted to go and learn the Dhamma. Are you gonna stay with one teacher? Well, I rest my case, <laughs> you know, because I, 
I don't know how it happened, but I ended up with a teacher who really did know how this worked to the extent that your whole personality could change and that it could give something that you could share with other people to help them uh, for the rest of your life if you wanted to do that. Uh, because it's so rewarding to see people really get this and start changing their lives. And um, he sort of dared me to do it. And I said, I will do it. And I've looked back on that several times. He's no longer alive. He, he died at about 98, I think. And this was the Bangladesh group of Bangladesh people in um, across the river from uh, Washington, D.C., in just in Virginia. And so the thing is, how do you know the person has all those things? You study with them. You practice with them. Can you communicate okay with them? How many of these things are happening with them? Some of them don't matter. Some of them don't matter. In, they're not ever going to do it in front of you or tell you about it. Okay. For instance, the supernormal powers, a lot of that stuff, they're not supposed to be telling anybody about it. That's what's so no, funny. No, that is fifth quality. Fifth quality is given. One who has mastered the supernormal powers, such as flying, water, walking on water, another thing. Fifth quality is there. If the person does all that in front of you, run away. That's my advice. <laughs> unless, unless you are the person's protege, and you're, you know, a special student that, you know, he's going to work with for a long, long time. That's a little different. But if he, if he's teaching a bunch of people and walks across the lake to sit down in his chair, leave. That's my advice. Because it was never supposed to be done. And it was pointed out to Mogollon. It got in a lot of trouble for that, you know. You know that story, right? He said, <laughs> who can be, he was just he was saying uh, who can be the first one to go up and get the flag off the top of the pole and bring it down and nobody could do it and then Mogolano walked over there and flew to the top and got it and came down to the ground and then the, the Buddha chastised him wickedly you know saying don't ever do that again don't ever do that again you know it's it's an issue the Buddha was aware of certain things he was aware of the things in in 15 in number 15 the reason for that sutta being there is for the monks to read that sutta and, um, and be aware of how some people you can admonish them and train them. Other people you can't. And the Buddha dissected this, though he had this incredible brain, he could just dissect everything so perfectly. He comes up with 16 ways a person will not allow you to correct them or admonish them when you're training them. And the basic message of that sutta is to the monks, if they, if they do, it, you figure it out for yourself, but if they're doing about four of those things, you don't want to spend time with them anymore, because they're not going to listen to anything you say. And I have been at retreats where not just Bonte, but other teachers will simply say, okay, don't come back for your interview tomorrow, because you're just, when I when I am, am working with you and I tell you to do something, you just prevaricate. Prevarication means you jump and go around what I just said and talk, 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 talk. In the, in the interview, you don't even listen to anything I say. And you know what I learned, Sarma, last year in that September uh, you know, retreat I did with the nuns, they didn't know anything about meditation at all. So when I told them to do something, they did stuff exactly. I have realized the value in that retreat of Sutta number 15, because there was none, I didn't have to worry about any of the 16 things that they would do that would make it so that they wouldn't follow instructions. They would follow instructions every single time. They put their faith in the fact that I knew how to teach them. They did exactly what I said and what I said was going to happen, happened. They reported it. They came back. We went through it. I, you know, they were tested at the end of their retreat to see if they learned the Dhamma. They knew everything. They took their notebooks. They, they listened to the, uh, the, uh, the um, Dhamma talks and asked the questions, over 45 questions from those 16 people in 10 days, 45 questions. They took it to heart. They left that retreat with no questions that weren't answered. 
So because we answered all their questions at that retreat during the retreat, we had the cute question and answer thing going during the retreat before the Donna talk each time. Because we did that, they were not walking around or sitting and those questions were running through their mind. I think that had a big thing to do with them being able to make such good progress. And remember with me, good progress is not necessarily going and experiencing Nibbana as much as growing your practice. You're coming to the meditation the first time, you can only sit for 15 minutes. By the time you end the retreat, you've, you are sitting two and a half, three, four hours. That's amazing. And now 30 days later, I'm checking with those women. And the best part of it was they're still doing it in their daily prayer sessions. They're still using it and they're still sharing it. They made a pledge to me at the end that they would share, everyone there would share it with at least one person. That's what they all agreed to. But several of them were ready to change it into their language, their dialect, and teach it to other people. And they, I believe me, they will. They did. That was an experiment because, in essence, what they experienced, as they put it, was they rebooted their minds. Like you would reboot a computer when it doesn't work and it's all jammed up, <laughs> you know, and then you, sh you shut it down. And when you restart, you put it through the restart. We used to call this rebooting and they rebooted that and come up with a clear mind and kept the mind clear. And when they went through that, there's uh, their, um, I was curious by the end of the retreat because the ones that did have the experience of cessation and turning back on, they were not told this was Nibbana. We tried to explain, we talked about the person who was working with me on it. And we said, let's just tell them this is a clearing of the mind and see what happens. We didn't want to offend anything. We were trying to teach them something valuable for their own religious system. So we didn't say, we didn't call it Nibbana, but we said no more fire. <laughs> so we use the definition of it saying there's no more fire, no more heat, no more grabbing sensation in your mind, no more tension. Everything is cleared. And th then they told us the symptoms of what happened. So with me, I see the biggest value for a teacher to understand is not to push people to reach Nibbana at all but to, to train them initially into the practice to see how open they can come and they will drift towards the place where it's time to talk to them about that if you, if you want to. But, but the value is the clarity of mind and that they can change their ability to sit for less than 30 minutes, 15 minutes, some of them. And all of a sudden they can sit in personal prayer, just open with the concept of God is with me or the universe is with me or someone to get well by sending it to the direction, sending it. And if they want to say with the help of God, sending it into the universe to, to heal people. I wish all of you were doing it at least an hour every day for Bunty right now because of what he's going through, you know? He's had two angioplastic surgeries trying to get the lock clots out of his legs. He's in the hospital right now still. When he gets out of there, then he'll they'll possibly take him into rehab if he survives this. And he's one mad old codger. He's the worst patient you can ever imagine because he's he's off. He's off with his mind right now because there was a kind of a flip in his mind. I don't know, nobody understands what happened. So, but for, nur for nurses, this is one of the nurse's nightmares. <laughs> it's just one of those things that happens. You know, with this kind of thing, um, he just wants to tell you, he wants to call somebody and just have him pick him up and take him away and he can't walk. You see? It has to be somewhere where people can take care of him, where they are attending him and checking on him three times a day. They can't have people up on top of the mountain and his cootie at the bottom. It's impossible. You want to scoop the cootie up and move it up top next to the kitchen? Maybe you could do that kind of thing. <laughs> 
He never, and then people, somebody would be responsible to check on him all the time, but he's, he's not there. He's not, he's not stable. He's not who we knew at all. It's very, it's very sad what's happened. I want to believe that he can come out of it. And there are some people who believe that the clots have caused a great deal of this and that there's been a kind of a thing that was some other things that were involved, some other organs in the body that were involved too. And so whether he can come back out of it is, we don't know, okay? But I wish I just could get everybody in the world who he has helped to really please, you know, this is now the time he needs the loving kindness sent to him. This is when he needs the support from everybody in the world. I was a little, little bit, you know, it's not important. Nobody told me when the operation was going to be. I would have put up the red banner and sent it across the whole universe for everybody to get on the stick and be sending loving kindness. And I wasn't in a position to do that. But that's what happens. So that's done. <laughs> that one's done. You know, it's done. But I'm just asking people, please, to, you know, make sure that we are allowed to hear about this and we understand what's going on so that people can spend an hour a day or something or spend a half hour a day and use this for a while as a subject in, in your meditation. You don't have to. I'm just saying if you want to help, that is the way they can help, you know because he can still feel stuff very easily. So that's about it. Any other questions? <laughs> Come back. Questions? No? OK. Question, Effendi. Yes. Yeah, yeah. uh, I, I have a friend that, that is having a, a problem. He, he got a panic attack sometimes mm -hmm. uh, yeah and I, I tried to coach him and uh, what could you suggest me to do panic attacks jeez you know there is a I can send you to you know do you know where that is uh, May there's a um, talk Bonte did the nat naturopathic um, college in Portland. He did that talk. And in that talk, he talks about panic attacks. And we had a friend, uh, a student that was up in um, the Seattle area, had a problem with panic attacks. And by practicing uh, the way, the first thing you, 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 you teach him is when you have to, in order to change a panic attack, you have to understand kind of what it is that's setting it off, okay? And um, to figure out what it is that's setting it off, if you're practicing, it's some kind of a hindrance that's coming up or some kind of a thing. It, and the thing is, it has to do with fear. Panic attacks have to do with fear. And when fear comes up and then a panic attack starts, it hyperventilating breathing and then starts the perspiration and then you soak through your whole body and you're very embarrassed and you don't want to go anywhere and you're afraid that if this is going to continue to happen you don't want to be around people you don't want to go shopping you don't want to go walking with anybody or anything because you think oh my gosh this can happen anytime i know because i went through this when i was in my 40s and um okay so the first thing is this is fear coming up and you say, fear is just fear. And the moment you see fear, you say, I'm going to be courageous instead. But the problem is when the person is just, you're, you're trying to explain it to them and they're not a meditator, the problem is they, they want to solve it just right like that, really quick like that. Okay, but they have, there are some pieces to this. So what is coming up is fear of something. And then it becomes a, a panic if you you start diving into the fear and you start <laughs> like this, you see? And then you can pass out from this. I mean, it's very frightening when it happens. And what happened, we were trying to explain to her the mo you have to feel the, you have to be able to um, uh, show the person 
ask the person this, ask them, where are the panic attacks happening? Panic attacks happening when I'm sitting, when I'm walking, when I'm in crowded places, these are the things you write down and you say, okay, these, I have to know, you know, it, does it happen when you're in a crowd? Does it happen when um, you're around people, you see, or if you're sitting and watching a movie, there's a bunch of people all around you. And then you feel this like tension from the people around you. Is that what starts it? So you try to look and see what is it that starts it? You get curious about the panic attack and you try to understand how it's happening, okay? That's the first part of it. Then if you can pinpoint what this is, you say, well, this is just fear. This is just a panic attack. Let it go. And I'm not going to leave. Why am I not going to leave the situation, run away from it is because of Anicca. You have to teach them about Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta. So Anicca means everything changes all the time. That's the first lesson. Everything's changing all the time. And the suffering is when I like and want something really badly, or I don't like something and I want to make it stop. And that this one is the, I don't like it and I want to make it stop. Okay. And then the way out of this is Anatta, the Ananta. So Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, right? Now, the anatta, what it means is I'm not going to take this personally anymore because here I am with you. I'm taking a walk and we're doing fine. And all of a sudden this starts happening. Why do I have to run home? This is just something that's going to happen. It's just going to arise and it'll pass away. The secret to the panic attack is a hindrance. And what is the nutriment for a hindrance? Tell me what the nutriment is. What is the food for the hindrance? What is it? Attention. When you pay attention to it, right? It's you're paying attention to it. It's going to just wrap over you and you're going to get soaking wet and then it'll pass, but you'll be standing there in the mall with a bunch of people around you wondering why your clothing is dripping on the floor. You are so, you know, exhausted. This is how fast this stuff happens. It's really awful. OK, but it's not something to go to get a drug for, in my opinion, because if you can look and see how it's working, do you have the chart for the seven links of dependent origination? You have the seven link chart, right? Yes, I do. Yeah. OK, so you look at the seven link chart. Let's get the seven link chart for just a second. OK, wait a second here. Wait a minute. Hmm. Hmm. Wait a sec. I'm trying to find it. There you go. Well, that'll do. That'll do fine. Um. Okay. So now I put this down like that. Go here, go here, and go here. Okay, so you see the chart, right? You're seeing the chart. Okay, so now let's see if I can make this thing work. Sometimes I can make it work, but not always. So, um, no guarantee. Let's see how good I am. Whoops, <laughs> can't do it with that. <laughs> That's really funny. All right, so here we go. So you see where I am right here, right? Okay. So on this piece here, this is contact here. You see that? So suppose you show him, you take this chart and put it down in front of him, you can explain it to him. So he's walking around or you're taking a walk. Let's say you're sitting on a bench. So the contact in this case, the contact that's coming from something that he sees or he hears or he smells or he tastes or it touches something. Something sets him off. Usually it's noticing too many people are around you. Some That's a big one for panic attacks, okay? You feel uncomfortable, okay? So 
the contact happens and you say when contact happens, a feeling arises. It's just a feeling. It is not my feeling. Don't take it personally. You say, just experiment with this. Don't take it personally when the feeling arises. And your feeling is going to be a painful feeling. Where is that? Mm -hmm, right. It's a painful feeling. I don't like it is where this jumps from feeling into craving. Now we're in craving. And here you are. I don't like it mind. And then from this, I don't, that's the beginning sign of personal opinion. The moment you had contact with something, unconsciously had contact with something, it could have been a memory, it could have been a mind thought that made contact of, from a memory that trips this off, or it could have been that he saw something, or he heard something, or smelled it, or tasted it, or touched it, okay? Now, the feeling was painful, I don't like it. Now what happens is, I don't like it because this is what happens with panic attacks. Ugh. Okay. Um, the clinging is the story that runs in your mind about why you like or dislike what came up. So it runs like this. I don't like it. And in this case, it's, I don't like it because whenever I feel like this and I all of a sudden have a panic attack and I start breathing hard and I get really scared and I, ha, 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 you see, that's the panic attack. That's how it starts. Now, panic attack is an emotional thing. It started right in here is where it started between the middle of craving and clinging is where it jumped from a painful feeling back here, okay? It jumped from that into an emotion. And the name of the emotion in this one is panic attack. Panic, see, panic attacks are right down here. See, this is the one that you need. Okay, okay so if I send this to you, then, you watch how it happens, the whole event. What happens next is from clinging while you're going, <laughs> your brain is also going in here to get what? It's going into VAWA. And it's going into VAWA to grab the habitual tendency, your habitual tendency. What always happens when this thought comes up and it's painful and I don't like it and this painful feeling is coming, I don't like this thing. You have this tension and tightness that's running in your mind and the breathing starts and the heart increases and you start perspiring. That's what's happening. And the habitual tendency is your reaction. The reaction that you always do right in here is going to give birth to that reaction. There's the birth of it here. The birth refers to the birth of the reaction in the single event. In this case, that is how this is happening. And then you go through this and it, it goes over to the Anicca, the end of this event, and it rolls over again and again if you don't have a way out of it. You see, he's afraid of it. Mostly he's afraid of it. And he's afraid of it because he doesn't have this chart, because he's never seen what this is, because nobody ever told him how this works. But they were very happy to sell him a drug so he can't ever have it happen. But the drug has a lot of side effects. Remember that. Okay. So the thing is very tricky. And if the psychologists were very nice and not thinking we were so dumb, they would get a small chart like this and they would start to introduce you to this, how this is working like this as it's happening in the event. You understand? So down here, down here at the bottom, we're showing you like, you follow the chart above, we just followed it instead of with anger. I usually use anger when on the on the bottom of this. Wait a minute, where is it? Here. The internal sense base meets the external sense base object, meaning however this is arriving, whether he heard something, he saw something, or he thought something. And the sense-based consciousness comes together. That's what makes the contact happen. With the contact as condition, and when you talk about it, you talk about it like this. Don't try to make it another language. This is scientific now. This has all been researched. When the contact happens, with contact as condition, feeling arises. With feeling as condition, craving arises. With craving as condition, it goes into clinging. Clinging, in, when you're involved with, this is the 
mental proliferation, the runaway mind. This is what away your your story that runs away in your mind about what's going on right this second. And then the habitual tendency when you feel this come up and that you have all the the uh, symptoms of this thing and the tension and tightness is grabbing you and you're starting to breathing and you realize it, you immediately say, never mind. This is not me right now. This is just this panic attack. You say, never mind and laugh. If you do that, never mind and laugh. This is silly. This is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. That's where this part comes in. This is impersonally happening to you because this is what happens with me because I don't have this information. I don't know what's happening. You got it? Okay. And so then what happens is from tendency, this tendency, habitual tendencies, the birth of the action happens, right? The birth of action happens. And in the end, you have the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, and the death of that event. That's what happens. Okay. So the aging and death, uh, aging and death title for marina means the death okay aging and death of an event is the during the aging of this event the person is falling into sorrow and then lamentation and pain and mostly grief in the mind and despair it's happening again it's happening again the other thing to point out to him is when you point this out to him you don't say this is it you say what if nothing is happening to you? you don't say you know nothing's really happening to you it's just happening from you you don't say that because he'll he'll think he's guilty that's not it you see you're trying to explain what if nothing is actually happening to you when you have this panic attack what if it's all happening from you because you don't know what's going on so what if i could tell you what is actually going on would it make a difference for you if you understood step by step how this movie is happening how this is happening that's what you're showing him. you understand yeah so we, you have to be careful when you're talking to somebody who's never had any of this information before you don't say you know nothing's really happening to us everything's happening from us everybody would walk around feeling guilty i think they might get really upset thinking it's all my fault don't let them do that because the only reason they're feeling that way is because they don't have any of this stuff right here that's why now what i can do is send you this okay send you this page and send you the work page and the work page is not part of this one i'm pretty sure no, this is just the seven links. The thing at the bottom is good. You follow the chart to learn how anger, fear, depression, panic attacks, anxiety, or grief arises. How does the suffering happen? How can the suffering stop? This chart shows you how things work. If you can understand craving, you can detect the tension that happens with the arising anger or the arising panic attack. And if you laugh when the, the, that emotion comes up, that emotion isn't there anymore. And then wholesome thoughts can grow inside by letting go of whatever's happening. We should rewrite this so that it covers everything. And relaxing the tension and smiling, wholesome actions will grow and they will happen more often in the future because panic attacks are a hindrance. They are an emotion, but they are also a big hindrance for your life. And the only way out of them is to learn how to cancel them so that they don't believe they can exist anymore because you don't pay attention to them anymore. When they start to happen, you change. You are in charge of the ship. And right now, if he doesn't have any information, Effendi, he believes this is all happening to him and it's very heavy and it's very scary when it happened to me i had a serious situation happen and when the first time i went with my daughter to a store after this thing i they told me like you know i might be able to but i can only be in the store 10 minutes and i would have a, a panic attack and have to run out and get in the car and hide until she came out and we could go home and she was determined 
it's very funny because I'm her mom, you know, <laughs> so and she's a teenager is very determined to make it so we could go in the mall again and shop. <laughs> but I was terrified. And so after a few times, we just went there at least twice a week, we would go drive over, come on, take me over to the mall, let's try again. So we go over again and again. And we, we solved it was by going again and again and again to where there were a lot of people and her being with me and gradually convincing myself that I could be involved with where the people were, which the replacement, I think is what I was doing, uh, be where the people were, you know, instead of being in myself. But it's not that complicated, but I didn't have any of this information when that happened, see. And people with panic attacks get a lot of help from us because once you understand what this is that's happening, you understand, but this panic attack itself, it is not me, it is not mine, it is not myself. It is just the mind doing this out of habit, you see? And then, you, but you're going to explain to him how this works. So essentially, you're going on a bike ride with him and, you know, he... He uh, has a flat tire, but he doesn't know how to fix it. What's he going to do? He can't fix the bike and he can't go with you. But if you teach him how the bike is put together and how to change a tire, then flat tires are going to be no big deal anymore if he's riding a bike. True. And if you guys have to stop, then you help him and you get the old tire off. You put the tube in, the new tube, old tube out, new tube in, or you do the patches. You put it back on the bike and you blow it up and then you get back on it after you get that so that you don't have to give up riding bike just because just because you had a flat tire now me when i was in high school the head of the orchestra she he wanted very badly to have another viola in the orchestra and he wanted me to play viola <laughs> I was like 15, 14 or 15. I can still remember this. And I loved the sound of the viola instead of the violin. So I said, I'll do it. And he gave me the violin to take home. And I was practicing and the string popped. I was so scared he was going to be real. I just was so terrorized by the string that popped. I took it into school the next day with a note. I'm so sorry. I broke your viola. I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> I gave up. Nobody explained to me. I just needed to get another string and learn how to string the viola. <laughs> I, 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 it was my way out of doing the viola, but you know, <laughs> but it's an example of how terrorized I was at 14 or 15 years old when somebody gave me this priceless viola and said, please start playing this viola. And I popped a string. That's all I did. I popped a string. I didn't break the bridge. I didn't break the, you know, the thing where you tighten the strings. It was not a major thing. I want to point this out, but it terrorized me. And I'm there. If, it's, if my viola is going to pop its string when I touch it, I'm not going to play the viola. I went back to the piano. <laughs> you see? So, so a lot of this is actually comical because we get afraid of things in life. And I'm not making fun of his panic attacks because I can tell you they were really serious. Um, you know, it's not that it's just that if we don't have information, see, like if you're sick and you go to the hospital with a heart condition, they tell you everything about the heart, don't they? You know, and if you break your arm, they explain everything that happened to the bone, don't they? And if you have a stomach ulcer, they tell you everything. I can't, I can't believe it. But if you go and you have a mental issue, we are still in the land of the taboo. They treat you like you have to do what I say and don't ask any questions. They don't really get out charts and explain the brain very much to people at all. They play this game of just listening to you and watching your eyes and that's about it. You know, the psychologist, the psychoanalyst, the psychi psychologist and the psychoanalyst and everybody, they, they do that. And I don't see why they can't take this and use it, you know, because in one sitting with a person, just having a cup of coffee, you can change their life, you see? And you know, if it happens and it doesn't work when you try and fix it, it's a game of play it again, Sam. Do it again, do it again, do it again. That's what Katie and I figured out. If I went to the mall enough with her, 
and I did. <laughs> Eventually, we got there so I could stay there for about 30 minutes. And if I went in a shoe store, there weren't enough uh, many people in the little individual shoe store. And she was happy because then she bought a pair of shoes. And all of this was about buying a pair of shoes and it only took a month. <laughs> One pair of shoes. <laughs> we still joke about it, you know? <laughs> so you, you can do things, but your brain changes by repetition repetition and if you're feeding the panic attack and if when you get afraid and start your the mental proliferation is running in your mind what what is going to happen oh what is going to happen what is going to happen then you're making it all that much worse and the little the little panic attack is saying oh boy this is great i can come back and get more to eat oh look at this they're gonna serve me attention 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 you see that's what the that's what the panic attack or the fear or the anger is actually doing it's like this little guy in there saying, like, oh more and more and more and more <laughs> you know like that okay get you have to i don't know if i have your email you need to email me a note and you send it to Conti Kama. We I can do this for I just disconnected it. That was really crazy, didn't I? You know, <laughs> I don't know if you know it or not, but here you go. Wait a minute. Okay, now we have to get rid of this thing here. How do we do that? Oh boy. <laughs> um stop share. And I want to start the screen again and go to the whiteboard. Okay, now we're getting to be someplace where, okay, so now I go up here and go here, oops. And then I go to here. Okay, so you write me a note. This is Conti Kama. These are lowercase two at gmail dot com okay and i will send you a seven link chart okay and i will um whoops i will um a seven link chart and i will send you a practice chart there's a practice chart that we made up where you'll see what i mean when you take the seven link chart and the practice chart combined, it's an exercise chart, a practice chart, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do. So you have to send me a note, Effendi, what your email is now, and I will get that stuff and send it to you, okay? Well, thank you, sister. Okay, okay. And so if this is recorded, I bet you can go back and listen to it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me let me come out of here. Wait. Um, mm -hmm. Mm. Okay, there we go. So now we can see. Okay. <clears throat> okay, everybody, make your uh, put your uh, questions together, and we'll take a look at them next week. Okay. Anything you have, and we'll go over questions. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.